I'm young, I'm 16, I used to go to like punk rock shows in East Los Angeles when I was like like 11 and 12, and hardcore bands would play uh, play and stuff, and the first time I saw hardcore dancing, I thought people were fighting, and it scared the shit out of me. From first to last, a band that is both legendary and unknown. It seems they've been forgotten by almost everyone except for their still lingering fan base, and I just happen to be one of them. From first to last is a band that deserves far more love, credit, and respect for the amazing music they created and the mark that they left on the scene. So without further ado, let your good pal Madison tell you all about his favorite band from high school from first to last. From first to last first started life in 1999 as a three-piece group called First to Last, led by Matt Good in Tampa, Florida. And honestly, they were just a mediocre Blink-182 ripoff at the time. This early incarnation of the band was very short-lived, though we did get at least one song from it called Day by Day. A few years later, Matt would eventually meet Travis Richter, and the first official incarnation of From First to Last would be born. Writing the aesthetic demos with Joey Antillian on bass and Greg Taylor on drums, though Greg would quickly be replaced with Derek Bloom, the band's longest running drummer. A vocalist named Philip Rigdron joined on vocals, and the band would go on to release the aesthetic EP in 2003 under the label Four Leaf Recordings. The aesthetic EP was very rough but necessary step for the band. Its production is surprisingly good for a small independent release. Its sound is that of early 2000s post-hardcore, with catchy choruses, pop punk guitars, and, and pounding fast-paced drums. The lyrics and vocals can be a bit clunky and immature at times, but in the case of aesthetic, it actually helps to make it a bit more endearing. The EP starts off with such a tragedy. A catchy heartbreak song showing off Matt Good's fast-paced punk-style guitar playing in all its glory. For the Taking comes next, and while not a bad song, the amateur lyrics and singing are very apparent here. But that's quickly made up with the next track off the EP, Regrets and Romance. A surprisingly mature song with both dynamic songwriting and lyrics that don't make me cringe. Though the standout song on this EP, however, is My Heart, Your Hands. It's Closer. This track is the most reminiscent of what we would hear from the band on their next album, as well as turns all the aspects of aesthetic to 11. First to Last really did save the best for last here, and it's great to see that even on their first outing they started their trend of climactic closers. After playing a few shows around the US, the band would end the year by signing with the legendary punk rock label, Epitaph Records, and kicking Joey from the band to make room for John Weisenberg. Hi, I'm Sonny and I sing from First to Last. Before we go any further, it's just as important to discuss the origins of Sonny Moore good old Skrillex himself, because his story pre from first to last is also integral to how things would play out for the band. If you want to see the full story though, then check out my full video on Sonny. That being said, here is a Cliff Notes version. Sonny Moore was a teenager living in LA who had a rather sheltered school life, so outside of school he played in bands and went to shows religiously. His project before FFTL was a punk band called At Risk with a demo of theirs being released when Sonny was just 14 years old. His parents 
parents didn't want him at birth and ended up letting his aunt and uncle adopt him. Moore was also an avid user of MySpace and other early incarnations of social media, and it was online that he had befriended Matt Good. After a few traumatic experiences where a close friend of his committed suicide, and he had found out that he was adopted and knew his real parents from birth as his aunt and uncle, this caused the teenager to crumble mentally, feeling abandoned and unwanted by his true parents, lied to by his adopted family, and absolutely devastated at the loss of his friend. So from first to last, he's been playing for a while before I was in the band. They needed a new vocalist, and you know, just, just like Metallica, and just like James Hetfield met uh, Lars Ulrich through the Recycler in New York, I met Matt Good over the internet. And uh, we got together and actually flew out to Georgia to the recording studio to try out guitar because either Matt or Travis was going to start singing. And then I ended up singing for the band. Sonny began to beg Matt Good for a chance to play guitar in From First to Last. And after a bit of convincing, Sonny got a plane ticket to Georgia and the rest is history. What's up? We are from first to last, from Los Angeles, California. Thank you guys for coming and rocking with us. Let's get this shit going. After auditioning to become the band's guitarist and Matt taking on the role of vocalist, one thing led to another and Sonny ended up becoming the singer. This decision ended up becoming one of the best FFTL could have ever made. Sonny not only had a unique voice, but also a natural talent for being a frontman. This combined with the band's iconic 2000s Molgoth look and the classic post-hardcore sound was the perfect storm of elements for success. On June 29th, 2004, the band released their debut full-length record. Dear Diary, my teen angst bullshit has a body count. Dear Diary, My Teen Angst Has a Body Count. From start to finish, the record is all killer, no filler. Chock full of dynamic songs, earworm tracks, and violent yet relatable lyrics in a tongue-in-cheek style. Dear Diary starts off with a call to action from Sonny, where he questions how he can make an impact that can change the world. So this track pales in comparison to the album's second and most well-known track, Note to Self. Note to Self is a masterclass in post-hardcore showing off every element from first to last had in their playbook. From Derek Bloom's fast and technical drumming, Sonny and Matt's vocal trade-offs, and Travis Richter's screams, it's all on display here. Two other songs of note from this record would be Emily and Ride the Wings of Pestilence. Emily is an acoustic song placed dead center in the album, giving a reprieve and interlude from the heavy guitars and sarcastic lyrics. The track is sweet and heartfelt where Sonny pours his heart out to Emily. Smiles and her laughter It's the only thing that I've been waiting for A time Regardless of our distance and our hope Cause greater Swept by pretty eyes and laughter is for A time Though this was spoiled when Sonny later cheated on her, but the song is famous regardless. The last track I'll mention is the infamous and classic Ride the Wings of Pestilence. And honestly, what can I say besides this is a masterpiece? It's a musically rich serial killer anthem rife with sarcasm and teen angst. It also serves as the album's official closer before a bonus track, and it really suits the spot well, feeling climactic 
and taking all the elements we've heard across the album and housing them in a 3 minute and 45 second track. This record would propel the band into the spotlight of the Warped Tour scene, gaining many dedicated fans and lucrative relationships with other large artists at the time such as Fall Out Boy, My Chemical Romance, and Shiotos. But this success didn't come without consequence, and due to some internal conflicts, bassist John Weisenberg was fired from the group, a necessary decision that would come to bite the band a few years later. Yeah, we all have like little laptops and stuff, and we record our guitars into them and write riffs and program drums and stuff, and like try to be as creative as we can every day for you know, because you know he's looking forward to the next record. And we really are. Stuff we're like all, that. We're all looking forward to the next record. We're all like we're really ready to write. You know what I mean? And, like ideas are being talked about so much, but you know we just we all I think we all can't wait. I think we speak for everybody. Like we all can't wait to actually get into the studio and like start really like making, you know what I mean? After kicking Weisenberg to the curb and getting the attention of producer Ross Robinson of Korn and Slipknot fame, the band would enter the studio in the summer of 2005 with Wes Borland of Limp Bizkit joining on bass. We're we California. We're recording our new record from first to last. <laughs> We're in Radio Star Studios in Wheat, California. Ross wanted to go somewhere kind of secluded. They spent the next few months at Radio Star Studios, recording their follow-up to Dear Diary in a cramped basement and old church. Today, pretty much what is the first day of drum tracking. And the way we're gonna work this is up top on the stage, we have a complete practice set up with um, full drum kit and guitars. And then downstairs, we were like recording in the dungeon that Ross built with his on bare hands and we have our guitars set up down there too so we can just go up here practice the song real quick to keep it fresh on Derek's mind and then go down there and you can wheel it out. Add on Ross Robinson's infamous emotional torture he puts on bands he produces and the end result was as dark and intense of a record that in almost no way resembles the sound of their previous output. Despite treading on new territory Heroin sold 33,000 copies in its first week, peaking at number 25 on Billboard. This was massive for the band and got them a major label deal with Capitol Records after a bidding war with Warner Brothers. Heroin is an absolute masterpiece. It's a record that revels in the darkness of its lyrics with one disfork track after another. Some of its standout songs include The Latest Plague, Afterbirth, The Levy, and Waltz Moore. The latest plague is one of From First to Last's most well-known songs, a track lambasting the decay of society and the music industry with lyrics like Afterbirth, on the other hand, is a slower, darker song about Sonny's feelings of abandonment upon discovering his parents didn't want him at birth. You can really feel Sonny's distress and anger, something palpable across the entire record. The first song I ever heard from the band was The Levy, a song that really shows off the band's growth as songwriters with a much more dynamic structure than what we've heard previously. The song's lyrics follow in its structure, a constant rise and fall until it eventually fades out. The last track I want to bring up is Waltz Moore, a track that's earned its spot as my all-time favorite song. Yeah. 
This is the most emotional and personal song Sonny ever wrote. And the way the band backs him with dynamic and somber playing just elevates it to another level. The way the lyrics portray a genuine sense of self-hatred and a desperate plea for help, something that's more emotionally gripping than any other song I've heard in the genre. The band would go on to support Fall Out Boy and All American Rejects on an arena tour in support of their album, following with some runs in North America and Europe. Though it was during their time on the 2006 Warp Tour that they ran into some trouble. Sonny Moore had to drop out due to vocal injuries caused by the immense strain he had been putting on his voice. Shortly after, Wes Borland would leave the group in late 2006 to focus on his own project Blacklight Burns, and in early 2007, Sonny would follow suit. Moore decided to depart due to the band's issues with Capitol Records, his vocal recovery, and a growing desire to pursue a career as a solo artist. The other, the other side, yeah. We made a new bridge to that song because the bridge we have right now is really boring to me. Okay. So we made up a new one today. Okay. And, uh... <laughs> After Sonny's exit, the band would get the news that they were being dropped by Capitol Records due to financial problems. Coupled with a recent lawsuit from former bass player John Weissenberg a few years earlier, from first to last was at the brink of splitting up, due to being broke and lacking a permanent bassist or frontman. Though the band decided to take on the challenges, with guitar player Matt Good taking up lead vocals and Matt Manning joining the band on bass. Using their last bit of cash, from first to last would enter the studio to begin recording demos for their next record. And after a few successful tours and picking up Chris Lent on keyboards, they would be signed to Suretone Records, a subsidiary of Interscope. In the spring of 2008, the band would release their self-titled third record. The self-titled album was another major shift for the band in terms of their sound, taking a step back from the darkness and into a much more commercial and mainstream direction. The songs contained a much more rock-influenced tone than their previous ventures in post-hardcore and new metal. The album starts off with the song Two Is One, instantly setting itself apart from their previous work with more straightforward lyrics and the aforementioned rock sound. Matt Good debuts his voice to the audience, and while being no stranger to the vocalist role, he had some big shoes to fill. And with this song, Matt both proves his place as a lead vocalist and differentiates himself from Sonny. A song that comes later on the album that deserves some praise is Tick Tick Tomorrow, a song that would be featured in the movie Underworld Rise of the Lycans. While having the most straightforward sound on the record, it does hold up with how solid of a track it is. Though, if I'm being honest, the album's final moments are where it shines most, with the songs I Was Once Lost But Now I'm Profound and Beheaded. I Was Once Lost But Now I'm Profound sounds like what I would have expected an evolution of the Dear Diary sound to be like. It very much feels like a return to form for the band, and for that, it stands out. The album's final full-length song, Beheaded, is what I wished the entire record sounded like, having a heavier edge and more dynamic songwriting that makes it stand as the album's finest track. Reaching around my pockets with the right words It 
really shows off what the band had grown into at this point, with songwriting that better complements Matt Good's vocal style and lyricism, and honestly, it's the album's best song lyrically. I know I might sound less enthusiastic about this record than what came before, and that's no accident. While I might still have an appreciation for it, outside the standout tracks, it's one I rarely revisit in its entirety. The album has a very corporate feeling to it, something even the band has referenced as being a casualty of signing to a major record label. The self-titled record would only hit number 81 on Billboard and sell about 10,000 copies its first week, a third of what Heroin did. And while to some that would be a failure, the band had stated that they were still proud of the record as it's what kept the band together during the hardships that they faced. After a few successful tours, the band would go on a break in late 2008. Chris Lent would lead the band to become the drummer for I Set My Friends on Fire, and Travis Richter and Derek Bloom would start a side project called The Color of Violence. Manny. Wow. <laughs> testing, testing, we're in the studio. From first to last would regroup in the summer of 2009, beginning to work on their fourth record. They would leave Suretone Records before announcing that they had been signed to Rise Records. Matt Good had this to say about the announcement. I want to announce officially that we've signed with Rise Records. We're all very excited about this move and think that together with Rise we can accomplish amazing things. If you're asking yourself why we made the change, well, there's a lot of aspects about being on a major label that just didn't agree with the way we like to present our band and our music. And I think that by ridding ourselves of that world, we're finally going to set ourselves free to make the best music that we can, and that is the most important thing for us at the end of the day. Though not long after this, founding guitarist Travis Richter would get let go from the band, and after a few months of silence from the band, they finally made a formal statement about his dismissal. Since the news has become public, I thought I'd take a minute to address it before wild rumors start flying around. Travis has been with us since the beginning and will always be someone I care about deeply. Unfortunately though, as time goes on, some people grow apart from each other. There's many things I could say, but they're rather personal and I don't think they need to be discussed here. This band is, and always will be, about making music with my friends. We don't give a fuck about fame or money or anything. It's about doing what we love together as a family. We aren't breaking up, we aren't changing our name. As long as we are making music we are proud of and having fun together, this band will continue to exist. We wish the best to Travis in everything he does, and he's still a friend to us. I want everyone to understand that this wasn't done out of hate or spite or any other negative emotion. The vibe needed to be creative together was just gone. It happens. It's sad and all, but that's just life. Anyone old enough to have personal relationships knows that people split ways all the time. That's how life is and it isn't going to change. We appreciate everyone who has stuck by this band's side through all these years. If this upsets you so greatly that you feel you can't listen to us anymore, that's okay and we understand. We still love you anyway. Just know that when bands make these decisions, they're always a last resort. No one wants to have to kick out a member of their band. It is never easy and always incites drama, but sometimes you have to make really hard decisions. It's part of being an adult. It's rather easy to see that the situation was a lot deeper than either party had let on, and the fan reaction to it rubbed Matt Good the wrong way. Though we never got further details than this, the pressure the band was feeling was very apparent. All of this was later reflected in the band's fourth full-length album, Thrown to the Wolves. Recorded with new guitarist Blake Steiner, and Dear Diary producer, Lee Dyes. Thrown to the Wolves is from first to last, second best offering, just under heroin. The record feels like both a return to form and an evolution. It brings a heavier focus on intricate guitar work, sarcastic and cutting lyrics, and a punk energy. It's also incredibly mature. Many of the songs cover topics other artists at the time were straying away from, like coming to terms with adulthood, finding love in a sex-crazed culture, conformity, and coming to terms with the death of a parent. The standouts on the album are Cashing Out, Elvis Said Ambition is a Dream of the V8 Engine, I'll Inoculate the World with the Virus of My Disillusionment, and Now That You're Gone. 
Cashing Out is the cynical opening to the record, where Matt finds himself confused and disgusted at the state of the scene. The track is funny but extremely accurate in its assessment as to where the alternative scene was in 2010. It also shows off the drastic change in the sound from the self-titled album, and a welcome one in my opinion. The song Elvis Said Ambition is a Dream of the V8 Engine continues this cynical outlook on life, where Matt sings about the struggles of daily life as an adult musician, being forced to face the fact that he can't hide from adulthood anymore. Though regardless of what's going on, he'd rather be living his life like he is than being a bitter and jaded critic. And the reference of being sued by John Weisenberg in the second verse really shows what Matt was feeling during this time in his life. If the album had a mission statement though, it would be, I'll inoculate the world with the virus of my disillusionment. The song is an expression of how pessimistic and tired Matt Good had become. Despite the pessimism, this track is one of the album's best offerings. The last song I'll talk about is what I think is the album's best song, and that's Now That You're Gone, a heavy and heartfelt song where Matt Good deals with the loss of his father, who committed suicide. You can really hear the mourning in his voice, and as heartbreaking as it is, the song is touching, and a fitting closer to a great record, and one that would be the last one we'd see for quite a long time. Despite the music being some of the band's best, Thrown to the Wolves was the band's lowest selling album at only 4,000 copies in its first week, and not even appearing in the Billboard Top 100. As great as the album was, it just wasn't enough. And with the low turnout and tours, the writing was on the wall. After constantly shifting in lineups, decreasing album sales, a lack of interest on tours, the band had had enough and brought it all to an end. Announcing a hiatus on July 28, 2010, Matt Good would post, Hey guys, just wanted to take a minute to update you all with the current status of FFTL. As of right now, we're basically going on hiatus. Now, before everyone starts jumping to conclusions, I just want to make sure everyone knows me and the other members of the band are all still very, very close. We've been best friends for years and will continue to be for as long as I can possibly foresee. So I don't want anyone to think that this is a result of animosity between them and I. This is mostly a decision based on the changing of times and the desire to start pursuing new things in our lives. This band has been the center of our lives for our entire adulthood to date. Four full-length albums and almost eight years of solid touring later, the urge to see what else we're capable of achieving is almost overwhelming, and I feel like there is no better time than now to go ahead and take a leap of faith and see what happens. Just know from first to last is responsible for everything I have in my life, good and bad, and as far as I'm concerned, it will probably continue to exist until I'm too old to do it anymore or dead. We love every single person that has ever helped make our dream of being musicians and traveling the world come true. I know without the people who supported us, we would be nothing and I'm eternally grateful for everything. Just know we aren't going to let you guys down and we still plan on making music at some point in the future when it makes sense for us all. For now, just keep a lookout for new projects and future endeavors from all of us. Thanks for an incredible eight years. 
Matt Good would go on to play guitar in the supergroup Destroy Rebuild until God shows. Travis Richter, as stated before, would become the vocalist of the Human Abstract, and Manning and Steiner would start a rock band called Eye in the Sky, and unless you live under a rock, you know that Sonny went on to become the bane of parents everywhere, starting his dubstep revolution as Skrillex. Hey guys, this is Kime Interviews. We are here with From First to Last. Never thought I'd be saying that, so uh, if you guys want to just introduce your name and position in the band for me real quick. Hi, I'm Spencer and I sing. I am Matt and I play guitar. In November of 2013, the band would return with a lineup of Matt Good, Travis Richter, Matt Manning, and Derek Bloom, all launching a Kickstarter campaign in the hopes of releasing a new EP. The initial post gave a history of the band and talked about how the EP would be six to seven songs long and feature some old friends on vocals. And with this, the hype was on. Though, if only fans knew what a roller coaster the Kickstarter campaign would be. The record would morph from an EP to a full length, with the lineup changes galore. Derek Bloom would quickly drop off the project and be replaced with drummer Ernie Slankovich, and producer Taylor Larson would join on as the band's third guitar player. This would bring some skepticism from fans, but the project would continue to go on. Another massive curveball came in the spring of 2014 when Periphery vocalist Spencer Sotelo would join the band as their new singer. This announcement was met with incredibly mixed opinions, though in a few weeks after the band's announcement, they would release a remake of their song Dear Diary with Spencer on vocals. It was absolutely fantastic to hear the song redone in all its glory. To give Spencer some credit too, his voice sounded great, though this would only continue to divide fans about the direction of where they were going. When pressed in an interview about the infamous Sonny question, this was the response. I know there were talks of like Sonny perhaps doing a feature or something on this album. Like what ended up happening with that? Or is, is he going to come for like a live show or something? Anything special like that? Yeah, I, uh, I talked to him briefly, and he said that he would be willing to do a song, you know, I feel like he heard it. I mean, honestly, dude, it's just he is, like, one of the busiest people I've ever met in my entire life. Like, he said he'd be down for it, but, I mean, like, getting in touch with him is just, like, impossibly hard. I mean, he's literally, like, in a different place in the world, like, every single day of his life, and it's just, like, it's one of those things where it's, like, before Spencer was in the picture, I was like, man, that'd be really cool, but now that... Spencer's in the picture and we've made the band what it is it kind of like took a whole new form since that idea was even conceptualized and now that we are the way we are like we're kind of pushing forward as like a new thing like I said like a new brand in a sense similar but different and I think like I like having the ties to the past you know because I don't want to like discredit anything we've ever done because I owe everything I have to it but at the same time I don't want to harbor on the past too much you know so it's kind of like a fine line like if you ever wanted to do something I don't feel like we would say no or anything so if you came out and wanted yeah. to do a live performance with us I'd be like fuck yeah, yeah come on it up it would dude. be awesome yeah. you know like nothing but love for that but I mean honestly I just feel like he's just like, just like the busiest person I've ever met you know so it's like I don't want to like bother him or anything the record would be delayed numerous times until finally being released in April of 2015. Upon release, it would receive results as mixed as the Kickstarter did. Now, to talk about the record, this is one that I honestly didn't care for outside of a few standout tracks. The whole album feels strange to say the least. Not bad, but not very from first to last. Songs like Hate Me, I Saw Me Swear That I'm Up To No Good, and 211 would be the standouts on the record because they sounded like an updated take on Thrown to the Wolves and Heroin. That being said, the rest of the record was a bit of a letdown. The album at times sounded like generic metalcore of this era, such as the track Dead Trees. Though the real issue on many of the songs is that they just didn't sound or feel like from first to last. Many of the songs like Back to Hanalei and Electrified sounded like a more generic version of Periphery than they did FFTL, with riffs and vocals more reminiscent to what you would have heard from Of Mice and Men's The Flood or Periphery's This Time It's Personal. While Dead Trees has its fans, I'm not one of them and the record would go on to become the most divisive among fans. Outside of a few shows, 
The band would also remain relatively silent after the release of Dead Trees. And while no hiatus was announced, the band disappeared yet again. After nearly a full year of silence, From First to Last would find itself in news headlines again, but this time in a much different context. Sonny Moore held a show on Beats One Radio on July 30th, 2016, and at the very end of his show, he played a snippet of something that he was working on. What he played was a demo for a song that sounded eerily familiar to Dear Diary era From First to Last. Instantly, the hype train began, and two days later on August 1st, Spencer Sotelo would announce his departure from the band. After this, fans were given the silent treatment once again until January 5th, 2017, where the Ausla YouTube channel would upload the band's first song with Sonny Moore in 11 years. And that song was called Make War. Sometimes you gotta leave that goddamn thing right where you lost it. I don't dig up the living corpses of Seahawk kids, I just caught them. The song was such a breath of fresh air, sounding both fresh and classic, and with the classic lineup of Sonny, Matt, Travis, and Derek, it felt like 2004 all over again. Soon the band would announce their signing with Sumerian Records, and following the release of Make War, they would play their first reunion show on February 7th at Emo Night in LA, and it was absolutely glorious. While this would be the extent of the band's activity for quite some time, it was still amazing to see and gave many fans the closure they wanted. From first to last would release one more single in the summer of 2018 titled Surrender, an even better song than Make War that captures the classic sound even closer. While to this point there hasn't been much activity, I wouldn't be surprised to see From First to Last spark to life yet again. In the end, From First to Last is a legendary band, and despite a few hiccups, the band persisted through more than most, giving us plenty of amazing music and side projects over the years. And while the band hasn't been given the credit they deserve, I do think over the next few years they will continue to be remembered for their contributions that they made. But with all that being said, Subscribe, support me on Patreon, follow me on Twitter. I'll see you in the next video. It's me, Madison Ray. Played up your pathetic little bear pitties. <laughs>